is the dental management of the surgical patients with cardiovascular disorder. This is the third part of our lectures. My name is Ahmed Al Marashi. I hold an MSc degree in oral and maxillofacial surgery from Manchester, also lecturer at the University of Basra, College of Dentistry. So, now we're going to talk about infective endocarditis. Infective endocarditis is a serious, life-threatening microbial infection of the endothelial lining of the heart and the heart valves. It occurs in most cases in the proximity to acquired or congenital heart defects. There are certain predisposing factors that might be causing the infective endocarditis condition. We have, for example, the mitral valve prolapse, aortic valve disease, congenital heart diseases, for example, patients with patent ductus arteriosus or a ventricular septal defect, prosthetic heart valves, and also intravenous drug use. There are still other unknown causes for infective endocarditis. The signs and symptoms of patients with infective endocarditis would include high body temperature, fever, heart murmurs, and also a positive blood cultures for the causative microorganisms. There's also would be a Roth spots, which is an oval shaped hemorrhage presents on the retina. We might also can see oscillars nodes, which is painful, as we can see here in this picture, a painful erythematous nodules and mostly can be found in the pads of the fingers and also on the toes. In addition, we have genuine lesions, which is in contrast to oscillar nodes, these are non-painful, but also erythematous, and can be found on the palms and the soles of the hands and feet. Splinter hemorrhage, which is a small linear hemorrhage which can be found in the nails. That's also a symptomatic condition. We have a few things we need to consider to prevent the development of infective endocarditis during dental treatment. There are certain groups of people which is according to the National Institute of Clinical Ex Excellence, are considered to be high risk for development of infective endocarditis. These would include a previous episode of infective endocarditis. So if the patients have had before an infective endocarditis, he would be at or she would be at increased risk for developing another episode of infective endocarditis. If the patients have an acquired valvular heart disease with stenosis of re or regurgitation, these patients also will be at an increased risk for infective endocarditis. This is mainly because a valvular heart disease which have a stenosis or regurgitation will result in a turbulence within the blood flow and this might cause um, damage to the endothelial and increased risk for development of inf infective endocarditis. Patients with structural congenital heart disease are also at increased risk for infective endocarditis even if the patients had surgical correction for that disease. This had some exceptions. So if the patients have an isolated arterial septal defect, a fully repaired ventricular septal defect, a fully repaired patent ductus arteriosus, these patients are no longer considered to have increased risk for infective endocarditis. Other patients with structural heart disease, even if they have a surgical correction for it, will have increased risk for infective endocarditis. If the patients have a closure device, that are judged to be endothelialized, 
then also these patients are a low risk for infective endocarditis. So these patients will have minimal risk for infective endocarditis in contrast to the other patients who have structural congenital heart disease. Patients with the prosthetic valves also at increased risk for the development of infective endocarditis. In order to avoid the development of infective endocarditis, antibiotics can be given for the prophylaxis purposes. These can be either in the form of amoxicillin capsule, which can be given in two grams before the procedure from 30 to 60 minutes. If the patients can take oral medication, then injection of cefetriaxone, either intramuscular or IV, of one gram can be delivered. If the patient is happened to have allergy to penicillin, but still can take oral medication, then either azithromycin or clindamycin can be used. And if the patient is allergic to penicillin and unable to take oral medication, then clindamycin in form of injection, intramuscular or intravenous, can be given. This will provide a prophylaxis against infective endocarditis. It's known that the routine dental activities, like for example, brushing, flossing, or chewing food even, can cause transient bacteremia. So, there's a comparison, which would be more risky, the bacteremia from the routine dental activities or the dental procedures. The bacteremia, in order to cause infective endocarditis, needs a cumulative effect. The bacteria from the routine dental activities will have more significant effects on, this, on patients who are at risk of infective endocarditis more than what the transient bacteria which might be resulted during dental procedures. So it's best to emphasize on the patients to maintain a good oral hygiene, good maintenance of their oral cavity, to minimize the frequency of bacteremia from the routine dental activities. The much more episode of bacteremia the patients might have, the higher the risk of invective endocarditis to develop. So we need to emphasize on these patients who are at high risk to have infective endocarditis to maintain good oral hygiene from the routine dental daily activity. These are a list for the indication of antibiotic prophylaxis other than the uh, infective endocarditis. Sometimes we consider giving antibiotic prophylaxis, for example, patient with sickle cell anemia, patient with, who have insulin-dependent diabetes, okay, prosthetic joint, organ transplant, okay, patient with autoimmune disease, other patients. These might consider to have a prophylactic antibiotic in addition to patients who have susceptible T2 infective endocarditis. The other part of our lecture is the rheumatic fever and patient with rheumatic heart disease. So we need to define the rheumatic fever. Rheumatic fever is an autoimmune condition that usually follows an upper respiratory tract infection with beta hemolytic streptococcal infection. Sometimes it might, the rheumatic fever might progress to involve the heart. This can cause what we know as the chronic rheumatic carditis. A chronic rheumatic carditis can cause valve damage. A recurrent episode of rheumatic fever with the resultant chronic rheumatic carditis can cause permanent damage to the valve. After many years, it may cause fibrosis and significant distortion of the heart valves and the resultant will be rheumatic heart disease. There are certain manifestations for patients with rheumatic fever, 
the patient will start to have sore throat and pyrexia. There is migratory arthralgia, which is a pain in the joints that move from one side to another. There's sometimes cerebral involvement, which can cause sidenham chorea, that result in involuntary movements. Sometimes we have cutaneous involvement, either a characteristic crash, which is known as arrhythmia marginatum, and also subcutaneous nodules around the elbows. Cardiac involvement can result in, can be manifested as inflammation of the mitral and aortic valves, and with recurrence, this can result in scarring, fibrotic, stiffening, and distortion of the valves. So the result will be mitral valve stenosis. And sometimes we have also arterial fibrillations. These are the common sequelae of the cardiac involvements. And after many years, if not treated, heart failure might develop. The dental consideration for patients with rheumatic fever would be different according to the manifestation. There are some important points that the dental practitioner needs to focus on and, and identify. The first one is the patients with rheumatic fever might present with mitral valve stenosis. Patients with mitral valve stenosis, as we said, are at increased risk for infective endocarditis. And then antibiotic prophylaxis might be advised. Another cardiac manifestation is the arterial fibrillation. Patients with this type of arrhythmia might be on high risk of thromboembolic events. So usually these patients will have warfarin prescribed as an anticoagulant. These patients will have increased risk for bleeding. Therefore, careful management of these patients should be taken before the delivery of dental treatment. Sometimes we need to give an antibiotics if the patient is at high risk for infective endocarditis, and sometimes we need to consult with the supervising physician for the risk of a bleeding if we plan to have extraction or invasive procedures. INR should be taken to know the level of the anticoagulants the, the, the international normalized ratio, and if it is some, something below 2.5, the patient will be at low risk for post-operative bleeding. The last part of the lecture would be about the congenital heart disease. Congenital heart disease is one of the most common developmental anomalies. It can be classified into two major types, acyanotic and acyanotic, and the acyanotic can also be subclassified into left to right shunt and the one with no shunts. In general, patients with cyanotic congenital heart disease will have more uh, sign and symptoms of these conditions. The clinical manifestation, that's which would be more apparent in cyanotic, can include polycythemia, hemorrhagic tendencies, and also a risk for thrombosis. Finger and toe clapping might also be evident. A simple test to see 
if the fingers are clapped or no is by doing the Shamrod sign. So we ask the patient to put their fingers together and if there is high angle between the nail beds then the toes are referred to as clopped. The oral manifestations of patients with congenital heart disease which is also more prominent in cyanotic congenital heart disease would include delayed eruptions of both dentitions, animal hypoplasia, and also greater caries and periodontal disease. Sometimes after open heart surgery, there is possible appearance of multiple white non-ulcerated mucosal lesions of unknown etiology. According to what the patients have, we need to consult the patient's physician. We need to refer for the medication that's taken for the patients. And also the appointments need to be given in late morning or early afternoon with minimal stress, as we said earlier. If the patients have animal hypoplasia and there is a greater risk for caries, then preventive therapy and fluoride application should be considered. Extraction should be carefully planned because sometimes the patient might be on anticoagulant therapy if he have an increased risk for thrombosis. Or sometimes the patients with congenital heart disease have hemorrhagic tendencies, so there is a risk for bleeding. So extraction, if needed, should be carefully planned. Local anesthesia with adrenaline should be kept to minimum and we need to consider aspiration. Gingival, even gingival retracture cord with adrenaline should be avoided in those patients. There's sometimes a risk for development of infective endocarditis, and sometimes we need to consider the antibiotic prophylaxis given for these patients. According to the recommendation that is given by the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, as we said, there are certain groups which doesn't need antibiotic prophylaxis. We have just discussed them. But in most instances, patients with congenital heart disease, even if they had a surgical correction, will be at risk of infective endocarditis. So antibiotic prophylaxis in most instances might be needed. Thank you. And if you have any questions, just feel free, post them in the chat, and I'll be more than happy to answer.